want to do today, we're going to put up the slide. Here's what I hope to accomplish today. I want to give you a surprisingly, what's the word? A surprisingly simple secret to a great marriage. Listen, today, listen, I am so glad that you're here. I'm glad that you showed up because today I'm going to tell you a surprisingly simple secret to a great marriage. Now, before I get there, though, I want to do a little recap of the last six weeks and kind of what we talked about. So the last six weeks here, if you look up here, here's what we've talked about. Listen, listen, everyone comes to a relationship. It doesn't matter whether you have no faith. It doesn't matter whether you have different faith or you're a follower of Jesus. Every person has this invisible box of hopes, dreams, and desires that they bring in to a relationship. And here's what we said. We said, listen, love really does matter. The problem is, is the kind of love we need isn't the kind of love we find in the romance novels. The kind of love we need isn't the kind that Hollywood gives us in the movies. The kind of love we need for a marriage that fulfills our hopes and desire isn't the kind of love we find in Disney movies. Matter of fact, what we discover, love does matter, but we need the kind of love that Jesus talks about. Matter of fact, here's the kind of love that we need. Matter of fact, this is what Jesus tells us. Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And and Jesus is saying, listen, as I've loved you, you must love one another. And here's why. Because, listen, listen, listen here. Look up here. This is, this is so true. Listen, I don't know how you grew up. I know how I grew up. But my definition of love was is I will like you and have a feeling for you as long as you do what it is that I like. And the moment that you stop doing what it is that I like, I will stop having these emotional loving feelings and it won't work. And if we're really honest, most of us grew up with this de definition of love. I will love you as long as you do the things that make me feel loved. Jesus comes along and says, no, 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 no. Love as I have loved you. And here's what real love love looks like. Love, love serves and is selfless. And here's what we discover. Listen, in every generation, I don't care whether you're young, old, millennial, generation Z, generation Y, listen, every, every generation finds this hard to hear. Love serves and is selfless. I don't care whether you're a guy or you're a girl. I don't care your gender. When you hear the word serve and selfless, everyone bristles. And then we talked about, well, what does this kind of love actually look like? And so we said, listen, here's what that love looks like. Love that serves meets a genuine need with a practice practical action. And here's what we said. Listen, listen. If you think love, and you just have this feeling of love, but there's no action, then love is just an idea. Love is just this thing out in the sky. Love that served actually meets a practical need. There's got to be some action with love, because love without action is just an idea. And love that is selfless means we put ourselves Second, it means we take a, a race to the back of the line. And we looked at how these two principles apply in all of our relationships. Matter of fact, we said this, listen, when it comes to marriage, when it comes to relationships that we want to be in, we said, listen, it applies emotionally. Listen, we each have two different boxes of hopes, dreams, and desires, and we play a tug of war in a relationship, and we said, listen, emotionally, we need to let it go, right? We talked about that, and we talked about what that looks like relationally to let it go. It says, listen, every human being has a love tank, and once that love tank gets on empty, the wheels on the bus will fall off. Very few human beings can make it on empty love tank. We talked about the love languages. And then in weeks four and five, we talked about the differences of, of sex and sexuality. We do big people church and little people church. And so we talked very bluntly about kind of the distorted view of sex that our culture has. And then the differences in what it's like for men and women. And then today, I want to talk about what that looks like practically. I mean, as we kind of close and finish this series out in week seven, what does this look like for normal people in everyday life? Now, if you missed any of our messages before, the great news is, is they're on YouTube, they're on our website, and you can go check them out. I really encourage you to do that. But today, here's what I promised you. I promised you, right, a surprisingly simple secret. Listen, you're going to be so excited. It's so good, right? It's so simple. Okay, here, we're going to put it up here. Happy couples know that a great marriage is made in the, what's that word? Oh, come on. We can do better than that. Happy couples know that a great marriage is made in the? daily, not in the dramatic. Come on, come on. See, see I think sometimes um, we, our, our thinking gets messed up. I think sometimes we, we may tend to think not correctly. And here's what I mean. We tend to think that, listen, our marriage will be great in those, in those large, big, dramatic moments, right? Like, you know, we, we got married and we had the perfect marriage, right? We spent lots of money. We had a great, we had a great wedding or our marriage will be great because we went to sandals for our honeymoon, all right? You know, our marriage will be great because we got 
about the house that we all want. Listen, our marriage is going to be great when we get the house we wanted because we'll have all the space we need. Or we're thinking something like this. Listen, listen, our marriage is going to be great because, listen, I per- remember that dream vacation that we finally took? That, like, marriage will be great when we have the kind of vacations that we dream of. And you know what? Our marriage will be great because maybe when we get that furniture, you know that furniture that we want for the kids' room and for our room, it'll make our house great. And, and then we think about, listen, you know what? Maybe if we just celebrate all those anniversaries, our anniversaries, we didn't forget them and we always did it right we did the perfect gifts or we celebrated the birthdays correctly and this is what leads to a problem this is where we run into it for some reason we aim at the wrong thing to have a great marriage we think there's these 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 kind of these large but few moments where if we just get those large but few moments right it's getting that house. So we, we got that car that you wanted. We had the number of kids that you wanted. Our kids got into the school you wanted. With those big few moments, it's going to make our marriage what it is that we hoped. But in truth, it's not the large dramatic moments that make a great marriage. It's actually the very opposite. Great marriages are made in the small daily things that seem like they don't matter but they have a significant impact on you and your spouse's relationship. And you know what the funny thing? It's just like being in a relationship with God, isn't it? Because think about it. Listen, when you think about a great relationship with God, you don't think about the few times you come to church and you take communion. You don't think about the times you raise your hand in your song, right? You know, you don't think about the religious rituals that you do that make a great relationship with God. What makes a great relationship with God is our devotion to him daily. Listen, no one thinks you're a great follower of Jesus because you wore the right clothes to church. No one thinks you're an awesome Christian because you sang the right verses to the right song and you raised your hand. No one thinks you're a great Christian because you served at church on Sunday. Listen, we all know a great follower of Jesus is not based on a few things that we do. You know what makes a great follower of Jesus? You know what impresses people outside the church? It's not what we do on Sunday. But it's the daily way we live to love others and to do what's right Monday through Saturday. Matter of fact, this is what Jesus tells us. Matter of fact, Jesus tells us this in the Iowa's account of the Gospel of Luke. It says, Then he, Jesus, said to the crowd, If any one of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own. Jesus, listen, if you want to be my follower, it means you don't get to be in charge. We're going to come back to a little bit later. It says, But then take up your cross, and what's the word? Daily, and follow me. And Jesus is telling us, Listen, you want to have a great relationship with God, you give up your own way. We're going to circle back to that a little bit towards the end of the message. But he says, Then it is a daily thing that you do daily. It's not this one time thing that you did when you were seven years old or when the preacher put you under the water or you heard that message and you felt some butterflies in your stomach. He says, It is a daily thing. And this, this principle that Jesus gives us to a great relationship with God is the exact same thing that gives us a great relationship with our spouse. You should smile because it comes in the daily, not in these large dramatic things. Which leads me to my opening point. If you're the kind of person that you like to follow along on the insert, which leads us to our opening kind of point. Greatness knows that little is big. Greatness knows that little is big. And here's what I mean is there are some things in kind of daily life that if you do them, they have a large impact. I mean, I mean, think you know this. I don't have to tell you this. You know this. Like if you save a little bit every week, then in years you'll have a savings. You know, every day, if you eat right, you'll lose weight. You know, if every day you exercise, you know, you'll be healthy. You understand that you can't go run a marathon and go, well, I did it for the next year. I can just eat however I want and never exercise. We know that greatness is in the little or little is big. We understand that. And some of you might be going, man, I don't know if I really buy that. Okay. Uh, so I want to do so I'm gonna give you an example of what I'm talking about. Uh, raise your hand if you've ever heard of the guy, Michael Phelps. Go ahead and raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. If you didn't raise your hand, you need to get into the 21st century. Okay. Michael Phelps is a Maryland swimmer. He run in the Beijing 2008 Olympics. He won eight gold medals and beat Mark Smith's, uh, Spitz's record for seven gold medals in Olympic. But there was one race, it was his seventh gold medal, where he won by, he won by, listen to this, he won by one one hundredth of a second. 
Matter of fact, when you watch the race and you see a replay of it, it actually looks like he loses. Matter of fact, as, as I was watching this live, I was like, somebody just wants this guy to win medals because there's no way that he won this race. But yet when they slow it down, you see he actually does win the race. And so Michael Phelps is asked to later and in his interviews after he breaks all these records, he wins all these gold medals. And, and you may see some of us people here in Maryland says we do crab cakes and gold medals in Maryland because in Maryland, if it was a country, would have been fifth in that Olympic for gold medals. That's how we roll. Maryland, right? Lots of gold medals, right? And so he's doing this interview, and they said, Michael Phelps, can you believe that you won? And he goes, no. He goes, I actually thought I lost. And he goes, I looked up, and I was shocked. I, I know I'd made up some ground, but to think that I won, he goes, I don't understand it. And then he says, when I went back and watched the replay, I understood why I won. And the announcer is shocked. He goes, well, Michael Phelps, why did you win? And he puts the microphone in front of Michael Phelps, and Michael Phelps says, listen, when you're a swimmer from a young age to an old age, they tell you there's this a touch pad in a pool, or when you touch, there's a, like a judge there. He says, when you're a swimmer and you come to touch the pool, you always keep your head down because you're more aerodynamic. You'll go through the water fast. You keep your head down until you touch the pad. He said, my opponent thought they had won, and they lifted their head up, and their head created drag, and that's why I won by one one hundredth of a second because I did the did the little thing. See, he agrees with me. Greatness knows that little is big. And this just isn't true in Olympic swimming. It's actually true in our marriages. Matter of fact, there's a clinical researcher. She's an author of a book. Her name is Shanti Feldman. She said there's some surprisingly simple things. There's five things you can do. There's five things for guys, five things for women. She calls them the fantastic five. We're going to put up there. The fantastic five. She says, listen, there are five things you can do for men. There's five things you can do for women. I did all this research about 90% of women, over 90% of men. If you do these things, regardless of the love language, these little things have a huge. They have a big impact in your daily marriage. And she said, I've done all the research. I did all the things. And here's what happy couples know. There are some simple things that you could do in your marriage that have a huge impact. Does anybody, anybody want to know what those are? I, I wanted to know what they are. So I'm going to tell you whether you want to know them or not. Okay, here we go. Guys, we're going to start with the guys first. Guys, there are five simple things you can do if you want your wife to, to, to feel loved and cared for. And this doesn't matter what her love languages are. I'm going to put them up on the screen for her. The first one is just to hold her hand. Like, you remember when you were dating? Like, we used to do that, fellas. Like, when we were dating, like, and so, you know, here's what, you can get some points right now in the house. Like, it's okay, even though it's on the screen. Just go ahead, and if you're, now, only if you're sitting next to your spouse, do not grab a stranger's hand. If you're sitting next to your spouse, go ahead and grab your spouse's hand. It's okay, hold her hand. And apparently, in all the research, what holding the hand means is, is that you're thinking about them, that you're okay, that you're showing affection. One of the things that says, like, 95% of women said they were highly moved and appreciated when her husband grabbed grabbed her hand and held it. And, and I was like, man, dude, that is like, I, I, I'm a moron. That's, I can do that. I was pretty pumped. The next one she says is that, that, that women highly valued a text or a voicemail or like an email. That's something that says in the middle of the day that you as her husband are thinking about her. And so basically it's like a digital hug. You're hugging her through the internet or you're hugging through your phone. You're just saying, hey, I'm thinking about you. You're there. I'm, I'm going to hug you. I'm going to do that. And then, and then appropriate affection in public. And, and what I mean by appropriate is maybe, you know, in church, you can put your arm and you can go ahead and take credit for it right now. Just go ahead and do it if you're, again, only if your wife is next to you, not somebody that you don't know, right? And so you can put your arm around your spouse or if you're out to dinner, um, they say, listen, and if you notice the very first three things that really, really impact that you can do daily if you're a husband to make your wife feel loved and, and she'll appreciate is, is this kind of non-sexual affection and that's, that's really important. And then the fourth thing is sincerely say you're beautiful. And, and I want to say something. I don't make all these messages um, in a vacuum. Um, we have a very diverse staff, and we have female on our staff. And I walk through most of my messages with my female staff. And one of the things they said is, is, listen, when it comes to talking about beauty on the stage, that our culture has a warped view of beauty, and many women struggle with their beauty. And I just want to say something all, all, to all the ladies here about beauty is, is that you are made in the image of God. You are beautiful. Our, our distorted view of beauty and our 
our culture is incorrect. And I want you to know that your spouse loves you and they married you because they saw beauty. And guys, we just need to remind them that we think they're beautiful and that the standard the world has created does not define their beauty. And men, when we do that, it makes them feel loved and cared. And then here's the fourth thing that you can do is you can pull yourself out of a funk. I don't know why this is about guys, um, but basically what women say is, listen, guys, like when you have a bad day at work, it's okay to come home a little bit stressed. It's okay if you like lost the office football t- pool or your team lost like the Caps did last night, <laughs> right? Like, but what they don't want to do is wives don't want to be our moms. Wives don't want to be our counselors. They want us to pull us out of our funk. And so the, these, these five things, like, like 92, 95% of women said that these things get done on a regular basis, it just it makes for a great marriage. And I, I would say, are any guys fired up? And, no, because listen, 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 come on, come on, come on. Look, listen, I'm not a really bright guy. I'm not a really talented guy. I'm a moron, but even a moron can do these things. I was excited when I read it because I go, I can do these things. I can win in my marriage. I can do the little things that have big impact. It doesn't matter whether you're a follower of Christ, not a follower of Christ. Um, Anybody who intentionally chooses can do these things because they are simple. And they can be done daily. And they have a big impact. Now, ladies, there are five things that you can do that really speak to, speak to your husband. And then we're going to put it up here. First one is to see the effort and offer a sincere thanks. Like, you know, maybe, you know, maybe your husband mowed the grass or maybe he gave the kids a bath or, or maybe he did the dishes. And so Shanti Feldman, who came up with this list, who did tons of research, she said, wives, you have to see the effort and offer sincere thanks. But she, she did say one thing. You can't say thank you and then add something. What, what, what do you say? You often do something like, thank you, honey. And then what comes on the end of it? Yeah, see, y'all know what I'm talking about, right? And, and what she says is, is as soon as you put the butt on the thank you, you might as well just wipe away the thank you. And so you can't, can't say, thank you for doing the dishes, but you put them in the wrong place. Like, that doesn't work. Or thank you for mowing the grass, but do you see that tall piece you missed? Like, she says, you will kill and crush your man. Don't do that. See the effort and sincerely thank him. Give him a specific compliment, you know? Like, say, oh, maybe if your husband's weren't working overtime, um, maybe he chose to um, pack his lunches so that you guys could go on a vacation. You know, think of something specific and then compliment, like, man, you brushed your teeth so well today, you know? Again, these, you know, the ladies, you should be excited. This is so simple, right? And then compliment him in front of others. And apparently men have an ego problem because everything in our first three is all about compliments. <laughs> and so, but, but listen, like, like think, like, come on. Now listen, everyone just laughed. But I want you to think about this. How easy is it to hold your spouse's hand, think about them, send them a text, or, or give them a hug in public? And how easy is it to give a compliment? So whether you have no faith, some faith, or you're a follower of Jesus, even if you're a moron like me, there are some simple things we can do. Um, also, to desire and to be pleased by your husband sexually. We talked about this in week four and five. Again, we do big people church. We have little people church. We talked about that in weeks four and five. I really encourage you to make sure if you miss those, if you're married, because I believe God designed sex in the context and covenant of marriage. If you don't like it, take it up with Jesus. He made it. Um, But women, that's really, really important. And then lastly, makes it clear that he makes you happy. You know what uh, Shanti Feldman, as she wrote her book, what the surprising things about what happily married people know, is she said, in all of her research, she continued to ask people, she kept hearing a a similar phrase from husbands, I just want to make my wife happy. And she thought that men were just like saying that because they had to say it. And then what she discovered was, is no, that, that, that men, even when we get it wrong, we really, really do want to make our wives happy. And we feel on top of the world when, when our wives make it clear that we make them happy. So you should do that. And, and here's what I love. Those two things, those two lists are very simple things that anyone can do in their relationship. You can make those things a daily habit. To daily say, I'm going to give her a hug. To daily say, I'm going to send her a text. To daily say, I'm going to give him a compliment. Now, there's some things in here that we can do on a regular basis to make our spouse know that they are loved and cared for. And here's the great thing. Greatness knows that little is big. That it's not in these dramatic, we got the right house. It's not in the dramatic, we got the car we wanted. It's not in the dramatic that we finally got to go to the Hawaii for our dream vacation. It's not in the dramatic that our kids got into Harvard or Yale. A great marriage is defined in the simple, small, daily things that have a significant impact on your spouse. Now, here's the thing. I started thinking, these things are so easy. 
I was fired up because like, I'm not really good at stuff or talented. I'm like, man, even I can do those things. Those are, like, those things are so easy. And it got me thinking, if those things are so easy, why don't people do them? And then I got to the part of the message that I go, I don't want to preach this. I don't even like to hear it from myself, but I know it's true. And so at South Point, we, you know, we love people. We love Jesus. There's grace and mercy. But as we get into the next part, you just need to buckle up. I'm going to say, like, listen, as I wrote this and as I thought this, I said, I don't like this. I don't even like telling myself this. I know no one's going to like it when I tell them. But I said, why don't we do simple things like this if it has such an impact? Which leads me to observation number two, that no one's going to like. Maybe the problem is my selfishness and not my spouse. I'm just going to let that hang there for a second. Maybe the problem in our marriage isn't my spouse. Maybe it's my selfishness. Because again, who defines love? Are we, are we really going to trust the romance mo- novels? Those are fiction, by the way. Are we going to really trust Hollywood? Their marriages don't last. Are we really going to trust Disney? I mean, here, here's what God has to say. Matter of fact, in 1 Corinthians, the Apostle Paul is writing to a church like this made up of some people who had no faith, some people who had different faith, people who maybe recently come to faith. And he's talking about how they should love the world around them. This isn't actually about marriage, but 1 Corinthians is one of the, the most read passages in marriage. And, and it goes something like this. Love is very patient and kind. Love is never jealous or envious. Love is never boastful or proud. Love is never haughty or, or rude. Love does not demand its own way. It is not irritable or touchy. Remember, remember what Jesus said about following me? He says, give up your, give up. Remember Jesus says, here's what it looks like to follow me. Give up your own way and then follow me daily. Remember, that's what he said. Jesus says, listen, if you want to know what it looks like to have a great relationship, you give up your own way and you follow me daily. It isn't amazing that when we come to see what God says love is, love is not selfish and love does not demand its own way. Now here's the problem. And here's, can I just say this? I I don't like this. When I read this, I knew, maybe none of you struggle with this. (laughs) Maybe nobody here struggles with selfishness. I know I did. I know one of my greatest things is always battling my own selfishness. I can get the other stuff right. I mean, like it doesn't take someone, you know, very smart to go, hey, I shouldn't do illegal things. Hey, I should be faithful to their wife. I should love people. Like those are things that are, that are fairly obvious. The hard thing is, is, is the selfishness that I experience in my relationship. And to know that I cannot demand my own way. And it got me thinking, why do we, and here's what I said, is I don't often think of myself as a selfish person. But if you ask my wife or kids, they might go, man, you have a lot of work to do on that area. And here's what I discovered. No one ever thinks they're selfish. You know why we don't think we're selfish? Is because we believe selfishness has to do with sharing. We believe sharing. Listen, I share. I share my money with you. I share my affection with you. I share helping with the chores. I I share helping with the kids. I share the responsibility. And so we think because we share that we're not selfish, except the love for selfishness when it comes to love is a very different definition, which is I want it my way. See, what we're really saying is selfishness is, listen, come come on, spouse. You, he, or she. Like, come on, come on, come on. Listen, I've got to be. Why would I be wrong? Like, why don't we do it? My way. Can't you see it? My way. We should do my thing, my way, when I want it, how I want it, because I couldn't be wrong. It's good for me. See, I told you guys would really like this part. I can tell that everyone's fired up about this right now. But, but here's the reality. Often, the enemy of our marriage is not our spouse. Remember we talked last week that I am on your side, that they are on your side? That the enemy to our marriage is not our spouse. It's often our selfishness. You see, here's what I discovered about sharing. See, we always share on our own terms, right? I can decide how much money of mine I'm going to share. I'm going to decide how much of my time I'm going to share. I'm going to decide what I'm going to say yes to. So whatever I share, it's on my own terms. But to be selfless means I am not meeting needs based on my term. I'm meeting needs based on your terms. That's what love looks like. And if we are very honest the greatest threat to doing simple things that lead to a great marriage is not our spouse, but our selfishness. It's when we have to say to ourselves in the mirror, I am going to stop saying, if you would, then I will. Let me say that one more time. It's when we have to get away from the mirror and stop saying, I I would if you will. 
Or I will when you do this. I will if you do your part, then I will do my part. And that's where love becomes an economic transaction. Which leads me straight in to observation number three, which again, no one's going to like, no one, like, no one at the first service cheered. They didn't clap. They didn't say, amen, Pastor Matt, which leads me to the third observation. It's not enough to know. We must, we must do. Listen, I discovered something. You know what I discovered? Talking about something never solves it. You actually have to do something. Uh, y'all act like you're confused. Let me change that one. You don't solve problems with words. You solve problems with actions. You change what you do. Matter of fact, this isn't even my idea. This actually comes from Jesus. Look at what Jesus says. Jesus is speaking to the Father. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not? Jesus doesn't say, hey, you're not my followers because you don't believe correctly. Jesus doesn't say, you're not my followers because you don't know correctly. Jesus says, you're not my followers if you don't. He says, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and then don't actually do the things? Listen, I'm going to tell you something. Listen, in 25 years of working with people, and I know I don't look old enough to do that, but I've been working with people for 25 years, and, and I'm not a professional counselor, and I've had tons of married people come to me and say, hey, things aren't working, and here's what I always say. I will meet with you once, maybe twice, but I'm always going to refer you to a professional counselor. I always recommend a Christian counselor because a Christian counselor understands that love isn't always about you, that there is some safety and healthy, but a Christian counselor understands that there's something bigger than ourselves, and that love is, serves and sacrifices. And so I always recommend to people, you know, you should go see a counselor. And then many times what happens is I'll get a call a couple weeks later and they'll be like, hey, it's still not working. I said, okay, one, one more time I'll meet with you. And so often I've met with couples where they go, counseling's not working. I go, um, how long have you been meeting with a counselor? Oh, we went like two times. And I said, whoa, I'm confused. And they go, what do you mean you're confused? I go, well, you've been married a decade. You've been married a decade and you expected two hours of counseling to solve a decade's worth of problem. Not only have you been married a decade, but like you had 30 years before that of your own personal problems that you're like, you thought two hours would solve that? Well, yeah, it really wasn't working. I didn't like them. And I go, I didn't know it was about liking. I thought it was about like working on your relationship. And I never get warm and fuzzies back after that. And then I'll continue to like probe the conversation. And I do that in love. I don't do it to be a jerk. I do it because listen, if your marriage isn't working, if you have something that isn't working, you need someone who can help you figure it out. And I'll often ask them like this, hey, did, did you do any of the things the counselor said? Well, kind of. And I, I go, kind of? It's, it's like pregnancy. Either you did or you didn't. Either you're pregnant or you're not. There's not like I'm halfway pregnant, right? You know, you, you either all the way are or all the way on. I go, what do you mean kind of? Like, well, I tried it once. Like I was, you know, I didn't get angry that one conversation, uh, but the other 80 we had, I did. And the one time I didn't, it didn't work. And I go, Go, wow, wait, that's practicing a habit, man. You're on it. No, I don't say that. I'm not a jerk. But here's what I discovered. People often get advice from pastors or counselors or books that they read or series like this. But it's not enough to know we must. You can believe something, but if you don't change your behavior, it does you and I no good. Because we've said from the beginning, there is one person in the universe who wants your marriage to succeed more than you do, and it's God. God wants your marriage to succeed more than you do. You know, it's interesting. So I kind of wrap this section of the message up, that I was on a Skype call with a couple who's engaged. A matter of fact, the bride-to-be was in my Young Life Club when I used to coach here at Leonardtown. Um, I knew her because her dad died when she was a sophomore around that time, sophomore, junior. Um, she came to our Young Life Club. Matter of fact, her and her boyfriend came to this church, and they were a part of our church, and they served. They moved out of the air, and they were calling me, and I gave them the recommendation that I give to all people dating, all people engaged, all people who are divorced and thinking about getting remarried, or anywhere in between there, I go, go get some premarital counseling. And here's what I said. Listen, I don't understand. How long have you been, you know, planning your wedding? Oh, over a year. I go, so let me get this right. You spent a year of your time planning this one day. Yep. I said, don't tell me, but you're going to spend somewhere between ten and $50,000 $50, on this one day, right? Like for a rehearsal, for dinner, for pictures, for the get. Like you're going to spend, you know, ten to $50,000 a year of your time, right? And, and you don't think it's wise to spend a little bit of time on marriage counseling so that the rest of your marriage can work? And then I always kind of get silence. And like all the old married people here are like, amen, tell them young the women snappers to like do that stuff. Huh, should do it. Well, you ain't off the hook old time people either because here's what I want to ask. Once you got married, think about the amount of time you spent with a realtor picking out your house. Think about the amount of money you borrowed to, to buy your house. 
Think about like if you've gotten a degree so that you could advance in your career. Think about the time that you spent getting that, 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 that master's or that doctorate. Think about the money you spent in education. Think about the time and money you spent getting your kid to their sports game thinking they're going to make it to the Olympics. Probably not. <laughs> Think about the entire amount of time and money you spent at Lowe's to make your house nice. Now I want to ask you a serious question. In comparison to the amount of time and money you spent planning your wedding, in comparison to the time and amount of money you spent on getting your house the way it is, uh, in comparison to the amount of time and money you spent getting your kids to your sports game, getting to the right school, how much of that time have you spent investing in your marriage? Let me say it correctly. Investing in your spouse. Because you don't invest in a marriage, you invest in a person. Now here's... Here's the part that'll make you smile. Here's the part. Investing in your marriage doesn't have to be this massive, dramatic thing. See, this is what's so cool. It's in these little, simple, daily things. Which leads me to what's the whole point of this message, Matt? And I'm going to put it up here on the screen. It goes like this. Great marriages aren't made in a couple of magical moments. Yes, we went to sandals. Yes, we got our house. Yes, we got our car. Yes, they got into that school. They're made in the day-to-day habits. They're made in the simple day-to-day habits. What that really means is that anyone and everyone can have the kind of marriage that they hope and dream for. Now, as I close out this series, I want to talk about one of the most important things. We talked about it in the beginning, and we're going to talk about it at the end. At South Point, we have this principle, and it says, you cannot give what you don't. 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 So you want a great marriage. Here's the problem, at least for me. Maybe this isn't a problem for you. I wasn't born with the kind of unconditional, selfless, and serving love that I need to have the kind of marriage that I want. If I was very honest, I grew up very broken. And the only reason that my wife and I are 24 years in is because of Jesus. And so I really want to ask you a personal question. Do you have the unconditional, selfless, and serving love that you'll need to have the kind of marriage that you hope and dream for? Because here's what I've discovered, that most of us want this kind of marriage. We want this kind of relationship with our spouse. But the reality is, is somehow as we go through this, we realize there's something broken and missing on the inside And I want to gently encourage you. What it is we need is God living on the inside of us. And I want you to hear that I'm not talking about religion. I'm not talking about a church. I'm not talking about a country. I'm not talking about politics. I'm talking about Jesus. And the reason that my wife and I have been able to make it through 24 years is because of what Jesus has done in my heart. And here's what I want to ask you when it comes to doing. You know, maybe you grew up in church. And you know about Jesus. Maybe you didn't grow up in church and you were turned off by church. And you actually believe in Jesus. But here's my question. Do you know about Jesus and believe about Jesus, but have you received Jesus? Because life is better with Jesus. And you and I and we are better at life with Jesus. Because he gives us the kind of love we need to have the marriage that we hope and dream and desire. So as I close in prayer, I want to ask you, if you're here and you have no faith or different faith, or maybe you wandered away and stepped away from the faith, and you want to do more than believe or know, you actually want to receive Jesus, I want you to pray with me. Pray three simple things. Admit that we're broken and busted and we're guilty. Believe Jesus is who he says he is and that he died and conquered hell and death for my sins, for your sins, for our sins. That any God that would die for you is for you. And then lastly, commit. And the reason that we have a tr- trouble committing to Christ is we think, I know I'm not going to be perfect. Great. God already knows that you're not going to be perfect. Smile. But that you would commit to follow him, not on Sunday mornings for an hour. Okay, I lied. An hour and 10 minutes. But that you commit to follow him 
daily. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. I'm thankful that when I got it wrong, and I've gotten it wrong a lot, and I was selfish, and I wasn't loving, that there was grace found not in a religion or a church or a country, but in a person named Jesus. God, I pray for anyone who's here today whose marriage or life isn't where they want it to be, to know that they don't have to feel shame and guilt, but that you love them and you are for them. And there's grace found in a person named Jesus who gave his life for us. God, help us to hear what you have to say. It's hard in every generation and every gender that real love serves and is selfless. That we can do simple things on a daily basis that have a huge impact in our marriage. God, we can't give what we don't have. So today, we invite you into our heart and ask the Holy Spirit to fill us so that we can have the kind of love we need to experience the kind of life that you want for us. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. If you're ready to take the next step in your spiritual journey or continue to support South Point, you can connect to a small group, serve on a team, and give financially by clicking the box on the right. To watch other sermons from South Point Church, click the playlist on the left. Click the logo to subscribe.